Well, this time and next time I want to talk about some sp uh, special classes of surfaces, especially, um, um, especially these uh, Horikawa cases. Uh, PG equals 3, K squared equals 4, and PG equals 4, K squared equals 5. So I'll talk about more general things, but uh, especially is th this is uh, the special aim. Next time I'll also talk about Godot surfaces. So, um, um, and the idea is to, um, you know, relate the geometry to uh, graded ring constructions. So, uh, you know, these, um, this work of Horikawa is around 30 years old now. Um, and so, you know, the, the actual results here, what you prove is not the main point. The main point is to try to, uh, get the, um, to, get an under, to use them to get an understanding of how these graded ring constructions work. And uh, these are sort of, well, quite complicated. I'm going, but I'm going to start with slightly easier material, uh, if I can find my notes. So we say, um, so S is a surface of general type. Um, um, minimal. And, uh, you know, so this means that Ks is nef and big. So we've had this many times now. Um, uh, and, you know, for most purposes, if you assume that uh, Ks is ample, uh, it's okay for most purposes. <coughs> I mean, of course, it's more complicated than that, but uh, if you just want to uh, produce some examples of surfaces and so on, it's enough to just assume that Ks is ample. So if Ks is ample, it means we can look at the map by means of the phi Ks. So this is the map S goes to, sorry, uh, P of Pg minus 1, and it's given by point P maps to x naught of P, x Pg of P. So I just I choose a basis. I choose a basis for H naught KS called X naught up to XPG, and then uh, so the X naught themselves are not really well defined as functions, but the ratio between them is a function is a function on S. So this this uh, construction makes sense. <coughs> and so if uh, if if KS is ample. You might hope that this is that this map itself is an embedding. So, e.g., uh, if uh, pg equals five, four, k squared equals five, then you can do phi ks from s to p four, and you know there's an image surface s bar in there, and k squared is five. And the if s bar if s bar equals s five in P four, then the S five is a surface with Pg equals four, S squared equals five. All right, so one one possibility is that this phi ks is taking the s and just embedding it into p4. That's, uh, uh, sorry, p3. <coughs> so, uh, you know, this is, if you're, if you're really optimistic or really naive, you'd think, well, that's what's going to happen. And uh, unfortunately, there's another case. So this is really the main point of Horikawa. So Horikawa about uh, 1970s, uh, around 1970, there's another case. <coughs> uh, 
So uh, uh, what happens in this other case is uh, you can describe in geometry and you can describe in algebra. I'm going to do both, uh, and it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to start with an e easier case. So, um, so just for the moment, uh, you know, easier case. Uh, assume that. Uh, assume that. Um, well, I want to assume that p equals three. And that the map, and uh, I'm going to put q equals zero. I'll explain what why we need that in a minute. So um, and um, assume that there's this phi k s taking s to p two. So assume that it's a morphism. This is an ass assumption, right, of degree k squared. <clears throat> right, and so the, uh, this k squared is um, uh, can be two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, we, I don't know how far it's reasonable to expect to get easy, uh, to get concrete results from basically rather naive constructions. I mean, there's the Bogomolov bound, which is somewhere up. Uh, um, uh, you know, if I do, <coughs> these surfaces have chi equals 4, so the Bogomolov bound says less than 36. But we'll be lucky if we get to 6 or 7, so uh, uh, with, uh, with the methods I'm talking about. So let's not too worry too much about the theoretical bound there. Let's just see whether we can do anything in these cases. So, um, uh, so the I want to make one very simple point, that under these circumstances, under these assumptions, then I can do phi lower star, so, so this is just phi, I can do phi lower star of OS, and this is a sheaf of algebra, algebras on OP2, on P2, And it's actually a very, very simple thing. It's OP2 plus A times OP2 of minus 2 plus O of minus 4. Right where that k squared is A plus 2. Uh, so why is this true? Um, so I don't really want to go. I don't really want to go into the detailed proof. So proof. Uh, I mean, sketch proof. I mean, you know, this in no way answers the question about how to construct S. It's just the first step. It tells us that in terms of algebra over the polynomial ring P2, uh, we, know what this, uh, what, we know what S is. So sketch proof. Uh, so this Q equals naught means that the ring R of S and KS is Kern macaulay And this means that uh, so therefore, uh, when we do therefore um, R of S K S contains this polynomial ring K of X not X one X two, and is Kern Macaulay over it. Right, and this means it's locally. This means it's a sum of free modules, a direct sum of free modules. Okay, so you know, I mean, this is a sketch proof. I'm not pretending to say all the details. However, uh, so this is um, uh, this assumption here that the KS has no base points. I'm assuming here that uh, when I say morphism, I'm assuming that KS 
is a free linear system. A okay, linear system KS has no base points. And that implies that OS is a finite module over P2. Right? And so, uh, uh, so, so, so I've got some polynomial ring here, and I've got this module here, and the stuff I was saying here is that this is a finitely generated as finitely generated as a module over this. And then it's a Kern Macaulay module, so it doesn't matter what ring we take it over, it's a Kern Macaulay module over the uh, over the ring. It's Kern Macaulay as a ring over in its own right, but then it's also Kern Macaulay as a as a module over this. And a Kern Macaulay module over the polynomial ring and of the di dimension two is a sum a direct sum of three modules. Right? And so this just follows by Auslander Buchsbaum. Right? So Auslander Buchsbaum says, here's my, uh, here's my module, here's my P0, P1, and so on, uh, up to PC there. And this, we can take this C to be uh, the co-dimension. Event. In this case, however, this guy is two-dimensional as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as an algebra. This is three-dimensional, and this guy is also three-dimensional. So the co-dimension is zero. Right, and so and so M is P naught is is free. Okay, so you know, I mean, I, I don't know if everybody, I don't know if this is sort of. I mean, this, is, this argument is really obvious. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you know Auslander, Buchsbaum, and so on, you know these criteria for a ring to be Kern Macaulay. There's absolutely nothing to this. It's, it's trivial. However, I don't know, you know, sort of comes as a surprise. I don't know if it's in the literature in a kind of very clear way. Right? And then, so what module is it? Well, uh, you know, you can, you can calculate that just by calculating... Uh, uh, you know, for the rest, uh, calculate, um, you know, for example, h naught of NKS. So by Riemann Rock, this is uh, chi of OS plus uh, k squared n choose 2. And, uh, you know, just and compare the left hand side and the right hand side. <coughs> For, this is for n greater than or equal to 2. <coughs> so this is, I'm just writing down the Riemann Rock formula. Um, okay, so of course I'm not, I, I'm sort of pretending to be surprised to get this very simple result. However, uh, when we calculate phi lower star OS, we can also calculate phi lower star of omega S. Right? So this is the dualizing sheaf. So th this is this is hom over P2 of uh, F phi lower star O S comma omega of P2. So you know I'm using sort of complicated things here to prove trivial results. Uh, this is um, uh, I'm saying, but you know it's all boils down to the fact that this is a polynomial. Right? So omega P2, this is omega of the polynomial ring. So this is uh, O of minus 3. It's basically just using the fact that x0, x1, x2 is a regular sequence of parameters. <coughs> right? And so if I take this module, and on, on the other hand, uh, this omega S is OS of Ks. Right, and so I mean, this is just this is so to speak a junction formula. Or it's a Grothendieck duality. For a finite morphism. So I'm. Uh, you know, I'm using complicated words here, but the, 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 the content is really very, very simple. Okay, and so, uh, you know, we have to get, we have to get, this is O of 1, so to speak, in this uh, corresponds to O of 1, there's an O of minus 3 here. So the conclusion is that this phi lower star of OS 
has a, a self-duality with coefficients with coefficients in O of minus four. Yeah. So somehow, uh, somehow or other, we've got to get from this O of minus three to O of one. And so there's a twist here, which is a twist by four or minus four or something. And then the rest is just duality. So you know, self-duality. What does it mean? It means phi lower star O s cross phi lower star O s maps to O of minus four, and this is supposed to be, um, you know, uh, O P two linear and a perfect pairing. Right, and so you know, I mean, these are these are tools. These are sort of, in some ways, sophisticated tools, but they're tools that anybody can just pick up and use. So uh, we can start using this. Sorry? Oh, do you know that it's, it splits completely in linear, uh, I mean, in factors or in modules? Three modules means left of bound. No. No, why? It's a free module over this ring. Uh, over there. This is a regular ring. This is a. Look, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 have, I have lectured this quite recently. Uh, so, so, you know, when you say Hilbert Zizidis theorem, mm -hmm. you write here a direct sum of free modules, yeah. right? And then you make the projective resolution. And then Auslander Buxbaum, I didn't give the complete proof, but I indicated the proof. Uh, Auslander Buxbaum says if you've got one that's too long, and you, uh, you can assume here, if you've got a regular sequence for the ring, you can cut it down to just the length of the codimension. Mm -hmm. Codimension is zero. So a cohen macaulay module over a polynomial ring is just a free module. This is a graded module, so it's a, it's a direct sum of line bundles. A direct sum of line bundles. Uh, so, you know, I mean, as you, as, uh, as you know, if I put Q equals, if I put Q greater than zero here, then we get some, something much worse there. Yeah. Right, we get sums of omega omega 1 and omega 1 and minus 1. And uh, in that case, I don't know of any case where we really know how to calculate with it. <laughs> but uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a research problem, not a, not a matter for graduate lectures. Okay, and so, uh, and so we can, if uh, D, so, you know, D is, sorry, if K squared is D squared, is two or three or four or five or uh, you know it gets harder, but it doesn't mean we can't say anything. Then we can use this to to construct this. So the trivial case, uh, D, the case k squared is two, so this is a equals zero is uh, just very easy. I'm going to write O plus O of minus 4. So this is OP2 plus OP2 of minus 4. And I want to make this into an algebra. Into uh, OP2 algebra. Right? So that means it's supposed to be a multiplication map. So, uh, you know, I call, if I, let me write this A. I'm supposed to write down A cross A to A. Uh, a multiplication map. Right, and when you do this, there are different, different things you have to worry about. I want to make it, uh, I want to make it symmetric. Right, so I want to, co co to make a commutative ring. And so that's easy. So this has, I, I want, the, sorry, uh, first of all, I want to make it OP2 at linear. Right, OP2 linear means I really write tensor over OP2 there. Right? And then saying the symmetric, it just means I'm going to write S2 of A there. Right? So if I take S2 of A here, I get three factors. There's o, OP2 times o, o, 
OP2 times itself, OP2 times O of minus 4, OP2 times O uh, of minus 8. So the only, the, the, the piece we don't know, the only piece we don't know is uh, the guy that goes from O of minus 4 twice into O. Well, I mean, you know, into O of minus 4 plus, plus O. <coughs> and so what this means is, uh, what, uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a section of Y in H naught of A twisted by 4. Right? So, I mean, this is a free module, so I'm just taking a basis of a free module. It's a, a, a free module of rank 1, so I'm taking a single basis element. And then if I've got an algebra structure here, I've got to say what, I'll be able to say what y squared is. So, you know, this y squared is going to be a 4y plus b 8. Right? A4, is a, a4 is a section in this O. This is in O of 4. And this is in O of 8. Right? And then, uh, you know, so this is just a, a, a double cover. Right? And so then, uh, you know, complete the square. I'd have to worry if I were in characteristic 2, but I'm not going to worry. Right? And so this is y squared equals b8. So in other words, if I want to make this into an algebra, what I have to do is say, well, I'm taking y here as a coordinate in this uh, fa fa factor. Strictly speaking, it's a section of this factor twisted by 4. And then I'm going to just say, tell you what y where y squared goes. So y squared goes to something which is a, of degree 8 in, uh, so this is in x0, x1, x2. Right? And, so, and so now... Now, so that, you, I mean, this is just a quadratic, a quadra I'm just saying, I write down b8, and I write down the quadratic equation y squared equals b8. And then you can think of it intrinsically as an algebra structure on this a. Right? And then, so a is now, is now a, um, an OP2 algebra, and I can take, pro I can take spec of it. of A. So this is now S, it's mapping to P2, right? And um, uh, you, you, you then you have to start worrying about whether or not this S is non-singular. So the equation y squared equals B8 is non-singular if and only if the curve B8 is non-singular, right? And so, uh, you know, I mean, this is, of course, too simple to be, uh, to be very serious. Right. And so, uh, you know, in the same way, if it's, uh, when k squared is 3, I'm getting O plus O of minus 2 plus O of minus 4. And then there's going to be an element there at y. So, you know, y squared is going to be in O of minus 4. And I can take it to be, uh, take it to be a basis. Right, and then uh, and then the algebra structure, algebra structure on A. Is, uh, you know, obtained from by setting y cubed equals a four. Y plus B six. Right. And so you know again I've done a little Chernhausen transformation to remove the uh, the term involving a trace. Right? And so in this case uh, in this case we know how to construct the surface S. The surface S is contained in P of one 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 two. So this I have to I'd have to twist A by two to make y a genuine section. So y is a section in degree 2 of a, and it's given by an equation f6. So it's just given by this equation. 
Right, and you can figure out when this is, uh, when this is non-singular. I mean, it'll be non-singular if A4 and B6. You know, it's just a hypersurface. So, uh, you know, Y cubed, this, this weighted projective space has a little singular point there. However, because of this term Y cubed, the hypersurface just doesn't pass through it. So there's some kind of little space, which is actually it's just the cone over the Veronese, and here's my S. Right? And so, you know, uh, as you remember from Fabrizio's talks uh, last week, uh, you have to be careful that this is not the general case of a cubic cover. Even, 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 if it's, even if that term is, if that term is not there, it's a Galois cover, but it's not the general case of a Galois cover. It just happens, it just so happens that this term here is the square, this is a simple cub cubic extension. Hmm? So, uh, you know, I don't, uh, we know what happens when case, of course it's not, it's not Galois if this, if this, if this term is not, if the A4 is not zero, then it's not Galois, of course. Yeah. So uh, K squared, I'm going to have O plus 2 O of minus 4. Uh, so, sorry. 2 O of minus 2 plus O of minus 4. And, uh, you know, there's a sort of basically similar thing that says S is S 4, 4 in weighted projective space 1, 1, 1, 2, 2. Right, so I need two, I need two, uh, two generators here, y, y1 and y2. And these are just whatever it is you need to find the basis of this sheaf. Right, so having done that, then I've got y1 squared, y1, y2, y2 squared. And so there are four, section, four things mapping to there. Right, and uh, they can't all four be, they can't all three be basis of this one rank one module, so there must be two relations holding between them. <coughs> so when k squared equals five, I get it, start getting into Pfaffians. Uh, you know, I've got a little research problem here, which might actually be interesting for uh, one of you to do as a, <coughs> a problem, which is, um, If you take the case, so k squared equals 5 is, is to do with, is to do with Pfaffians, and I'm not, not going to say anything about it. But k squared equals 6 is, in, is interesting, uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of things here. I'm assuming S is non-singular with KS ample. I'm assuming the morphism given by, um, the, the rational map given by the canonical system is, uh, finite, six to one. So uh, uh, I believe that easy constructions give two different families. Uh, well, let, let me say two, two families of S in P one one two 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 two. Right. So that I'm waiting. I'm writing down here a weighted, pro a weighted projective space of dimension one. There are three. This is P one. There are three ones and four twos. Right. So this is a bit like the things that uh, and uh, that uh, Stephen, Stephen Cotton was lecturing about. So this is six dimensional. So this is S in co-dimension four. So this is a place where we don't really know, we don't know how to construct every variety, but we do know how to construct some examples. So, so there are two, two different constructions and they're based on uh, P2 cross P2 and P1 cross P1 cross P1. So, uh, 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 you can do this without any reference to Tom and Jerry. You can, uh, you can do it just so, you know, you know what the equations of P2 cross P2 are. I take a 6 by 6 matrix, M11, M12, M13, no symmetry, M33, 
and then I take wedge 2 of this equals 0. Right? So imagine that this matrix is made up of quadratic, so each, all the entries, entries mij of degree 2 in this ring. Right? But otherwise general. I mean, just completely general. And then I take wedge 2 equals 0. So I'm getting nine equations here of degree 4. So I'm getting what I need here to define an algebra structure on this. So, so here I'm having O plus 4O of minus 2 plus O of minus 4. And I'm getting nine equations which is, uh, you know, like the kernel, the kernel of S2 of this into there. And le let me not, let me not. Nine equations, so y, i, y, j uh, equals uh, a quartic. <coughs> okay, so, you know, if you take y, i, y, j, there are 10 of them here. If I take the product of two sections here, I get a section here. Right? So there have to be nine linearly de linear dependence relations here. And I say this is one way of doing it in such a way that we get 16 zizages. So this gives nine equations with 16 zizages. Right, and then there's a sort of basically similar construction for this. Okay, now uh, an interesting question, which uh, I don't know how to answer immediately, and it might be a little bit of a, you know, uh, a little project for a master's student or something, uh, uh, is uh, uh, are these two surfaces the same? Are these two families the same? So in other words, the construction, the construction here are different. The set of equations you write down are quite different. However, you know, we're, we're in small dimension here. These are, these are comparatively big varieties, and I'm taking comparatively small sections of them. And it's possible that accidentally these are the same, or at least the two families intersect in a non-trivial way. So I don't, you know, I'm saying this as a kind of algebraic trick for writing down nine equations with 16 syzygies. But you can also think of this in some geometric terms. As, uh, uh, anyway, you know, there's an interesting, there's, this is an interesting question. So maybe we can, maybe we can think about this when you come to Warwick. <laughs> so anyway, that's, so that's what happens in, uh, um, so, so you know, there's, you know, if you want me to say something about k squared equals 7, then you know I can probably eventually find you a surface, or k squared equals 8. Uh, you know, it will eventually get quite hard. So let me go back to, uh, let me go back to this pg equals 3 k squared equals 3. So as I said, I'm, I'm aiming, aiming to get to this, uh, this Horikawa results. Uh, and I want to start with a case which is easy enough that you really can understand everything about it. <coughs> so we know that uh, S, so phi k S from S to P2, a morphism, with 3 to 1, with, um, uh, you know, S isomorphic to S6 in wedge projective space 1, 1, 1, 2, is one solution. And the argument I've given here is, if you assume that this is a, if you assume that this is a morphism, I'm also assuming that Q is zero. Or, you know, you could of course prove that Q is zero, but I'm not, I'm not worrying about that. I'm just assuming that Q is zero. The arguments I've given here said that if you assume that this is a morphism, in other words, if you assume that uh, Ks 
is free, linear system has no base points, then you automatically get this. Right, so what are the other alternatives? What are the alternatives? So our alternative is that uh, Ks has one transversal base point. Right, and so what, the, what that means is, think of the elements in there as being curves, and what I want to say is that here is uh, a curve, and here are all the other curves in the linear system. Right, so there's a point P in S, and all the curves C in KS pass through P, and, uh, g g g and in general they're transverse. Gen general, they're transverse. Or, you know, another way of saying it is that the equations of C generate the maximal ideal MP. <coughs> okay. Uh, so does this really happen? And uh, if it does happen, what can you say about it? Well, uh, you know, the, this, this argument here goes back to Horikawa and, uh, well, you know, it probably goes back before then, but uh, Horikawa and then a guy called Valentin Ilyev. Uh, this is around 1980. <coughs> I'm, going to give, I'm going to give an argument, you know, which is sort of... So, I can look at the Ks. So this is a linear system on the surface S, and I can restrict him to the curve C. Right, so Ks times C is 3. And so this is, these are divisors of degree 3 on C. And they're moving in a linear system with one fixed point. So it follows this is necessarily, this thing is necessarily the fixed point P plus a G12. So G12 is a linear system on C of degree 2 and geometric and projective dimension 1. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, let me let me give a little. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, everybody should have seen this. You should have seen it when you studied the Riemann Rochner curve. So uh, I want to say, so uh, hyperelliptic curve uh, is uh, C is mapping two to one to P one. Let me let me let me write g here. So genus here, the genus will be uh, you know some given number. It's four in this case, but in later cases it'll be you know six or something. So uh, <coughs> so so let me uh, let, let let me just say what let me just say who this is, what this is, and so you know it means that I take p one with for example coordinates s one s two, and then I write down a, 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 a polynomial f. 2g plus 2 of s1, s2. And then I write down uh, y squared equals that. Right, so here's the curve C. Over P1. So I've got P1 over the complex numbers. I'm drawing, you know, kind of the real line in the complex numbers. So uh, there are 2g plus 2 points in general, 2g plus 2 uh, uh, distinct points, where the, uh, which are the zeros of this uh, polynomial. So I'm assuming this has distinct roots in order that the C is non-singular. Right? So there are these, uh, these points. So they map down to points Pi in P1. And then, you know, maybe if I need separate notation, also Pi in C. <coughs> So 
So then, um, you know, the, uh, here is the general D. D is the pullback pi up the star O P1 of 1. And so this is, in general, two points which moves along the curve. So, sorry, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really interested in real geometry, right? I'm really thinking of this as being a complex picture with, uh, you know, <coughs> a curve of genus, uh, a complex curve of genus G here, right? I'm just drawing it for convenience to have the branch points, right? So, uh, you know, this D is a G12. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it contains things like P1, P plus Q in general, two different points, uh, you know, conjugate under the involution. This thing has a, this thing has a hyperelliptic involution, which is just the map Y goes to minus Y. Right? This is a quadratic equation, so I can interchange the two Roots. That's a Galois symmetry, right? And then sometimes it has two uh, p i, right? So when this happens, this is a Weierstrass point. It's just traditional to call it Weierstrass point. It's also a branch point, if you like, ramification point. So we're going to do uh, two or three different calculations, which are going to come uh, in, the, in, the, in this lecture and next lecture, which come down to a graded ring on C corresponding to a divisor made, of, made up of via stress points. Right. And the first one we need to do is this, the ring of C and a single point P with 2P is the G12. So this ring is, uh, so this is, you know, this is, this works for all, G, all genus G. I'm going to use it in the, in the particular case, I'm going to use this especially in the case G equals uh, 4, 5 and 6. Right. So, um, so what is this? So it's a ring over the field K. K is C, if there's any doubt. Uh, K, and then I've got to have an element X, and then Y. Let me just write the result. Z divided by F. Right. And so these are of degree one, two, two G plus one, and this equation is of degree four G plus two. And the equation is really saying that y, z squared is f 2g plus 1 of x squared and y. OK, so let's try and understand what this formula is saying. So here's my, here's my point p on the curve. Here's p1. <clears throat> so x is this uh, x is OC, it's just the inclusion of OC in, in OC of P. Right? So you know well, when we do Riemann Rock, we say the space of rational functions on C that have a single pole at P. Right? So we allow a single pole at P, but of course on a curve of genus not zero then I can't possibly get a non-trivial function here. So the only function here I get is the function 1. 1 thought of as something which doesn't generate this sheaf. It's, um, it generates the maximal ideal times this sheaf. Uh, you know, I'm saying trivial things, but... Uh, right. Anyway, then when we look at y, when we, when, we, when we look at 2p, we're going to find, if I take OC of 2p, then of course I've got x squared in there, but I've also got y, right? So here, when we did the Weierstrass model of an elliptic curve, this 
extra element y was coming from Riemann Rock. Here it's coming from the assumption that I have a G12. Okay? So then I've got x squared and y, and these x squared y take c into p1, and they take, take the, the point p is mapping to, you know, 0 or something, x equals 0. <coughs> And it's, uh, is, uh, this P is a branch point. Right? It's a branch point because if I take the function x squared, uh, so if I take the function, uh, you know, the, the linear, f so this is S1, S2, and S1 is x squared, S2 is y. So if I take, the, if I take, if I take uh, S1, on P1 and lift it up here, it vanishes not once at P, but twice at P. P is a branch point. <coughs> right? And this means there are two G plus one other branch points. Okay, this map is uh, two, to, two to one cover. So in particular, it's surjective. So in particular, it's not... In particular, these X squared and Y are algebraically independent. Right. So in any degree, in any degree less than or equal to 2G, there are um, uh, exactly the right number of monomials, right? Uh, so I'm going to be doing this for a little while, so I'm, so, I'm sorry this is sort of long-winded, but so, uh, you know, in, in degree 2G, for example, I've got there x to the power of 2G and x to the power of 2G minus 2Y and so on, all the way down to x to the power of uh, 2Y to the G minus 1 and then Y to the G. Right. If you figure out how many monomials there are here, it's a g plus one. Right. On the other hand, uh, you know, now we can, you know, we can say what is h naught of this linear system twice, you know, g times the uh, g one two. Right. And so, uh, and so now. You know, we can do this also for 2g minus 2 and so on, all the way up to, and then you'd be using Clifford's theorem. But here I'm, here I'm going to say I'm just using Riemann Rock. This is a non, this is a non-special divisor. I should have, I should have said, I should have said in this context. Um, so, 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 so look, uh, genus of C is. G, there are two G plus two branch points, and KC is G minus one times the G one two, so it has degree two G minus two. Right. So, so this guy here that I'm writing down is a non-special divisor, and so this means it has uh, its dimension, the dimension H naught of uh, you know, 2g times p is 1 minus g plus 2g, right, which is this. <coughs> so in other words, I've told you what happens in degree 1 and what happens in degree 2. If you go to degree 3, you'll find I've got x cubed and xy, and this is enough. There are no more sections. Right, and no more sections by Clifford's theorem, and then you know x to the fourth x squared y, y squared, and the, these uh, these guys here are in OC of OC of four uh, p, and uh, there are no more of them again by Clifford's theorem. So uh, so you know I mean this is a simple argument. Uh, uh, <coughs> there's a kind of maximum number of sections I can have in these bundles, and they, and because because the G12 is the most special possible linear system on any curve, I always get the, the lot. 
Right. However, when I go to 2g plus 1p, uh, I have I have x times all the above, x times the above, which is g plus 1, but the dimension h0 of this guy is g plus 2, by the same calculation. Right? And so therefore there's a new element. There's a new element z. Um, Right. So it's important to understand this. The, uh, when I'm writing down the x and y, so uh, you know, remember x and y are not really functions. You, uh, it's the ratio between x squared and y, which is this linear function on p1. Right. So whenever I write down monomials here and take ratios between them, I'm writing down which are functions that are not really functions on c, they're just lifts of function from p1. So they're invariant under the uh, Galois involution, under the... Uh, hyperelliptic involution. Right? So when I write down this z, this is the first time I write down something which is not invariant. So this one, I can take, I'm going to take this one to be anti-invariant. So that's the same as, as ensuring that z is trace-free, or it's the same as just completing the square. Right. I, I need this calculation several times. It's, uh, um, I should have said one other, one other little thing about this, which is that I wrote down this equation. Right. You can ask who is divisor of y on, on C. And this is, um, you know, uh, let me again, let me call these, this is Q1 plus Q2 plus, plus Q2G plus 2. It's a sum of, it's the sum of the, um, the branch points, the, the branch points upstairs, ramification points. Yes? And the consequence of this is that, uh, is that, so, so, you know, this is something that turns up again and again in calculating with hyperelliptic curves. If I take this divisor, Q1 plus Q2 plus plus q, 2g plus 2, this is linearly equivalent to g plus 1 times the g plus, g1, 2. Right? And so that's basically this equation. Right? The divisor of y is these, uh, the, all the branch points. Right? The divisor of this is the same. It's the, it's the branch points downstairs. So by the time you clear the square root, uh, you, you get this uh, you get this linear equivalence. I'm going to I'm going to need this, and I'm going to need this result there. So uh, you know, quite generally, if uh, C is hyperelliptic and D is a sum of via stress points. So any divisor made up of via stress points, that's the same as saying any divisor which is invariant under the hyperelliptic involution, then R of C and D can be calculated easily by this kind of construction. Um. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, that's not uh, really what we needed. So let's go. Let, so, so that was a, that was. A, I was telling you there everything you need to know about hyperelliptic curves. Right. Let's come back now to this uh, to this argument. So in this argument, I'm starting with a surface with pg equals 3, k squared equals 3. And I'm assuming that there's a transverse space point. So when I do this, there's this point here. Uh, I said transverse space point, so we can assume the curve C 
uh, passes non-singularly through the point, and then by Bertini's theorem you can assume it's non-singular everywhere else. Right? And that means that this thing here, the canonical system of the surface restricted down to the curve, is the fixed point P plus this G12. So let me uh, refer back to this. So I claim that in star, P is a Weierstrass point. Let's see. OK, so why is that? So let's ask who is KC? So we know the adjunction formula. This is Ks plus c restricted to c. But Ks and c are the same thing. So this is uh, uh, twice Ks restricted to c. OK? But, uh, but this is, but also Kc is 3 times the g12. So the, the equation that we're getting is twice P plus twice the G12 is linearly equivalent on C uh, to uh, 3 times the G12. And therefore, 2P is in the G, a G12. Right. So, you know, the, this is... Uh, um, <coughs> This is the best kind of argument. You can, under, you can boil it down to something which is just uh, uh, simple things on curves. So I want to tell you, I want to tell you what, uh, I want to tell you what the ring of S and KS is. So this is what I want. But the first uh, simple approximation is uh, R of S and KS, uh, sorry, R of C and KS restricted to C. And this is equal to R of C and 3P. Okay, so uh, you know this is con of course contained in R of C and P, and this one here is K of. Um, I'm sorry if you. I'm going to change the notation here. I'm going to write U, V, and W because I want X, Y, and Z again. Right, where this is the previous X, so these are degree one, two, and. So the genus is 4, 2g plus 2 is 9, this is f9, f18. So, um, you know, if I know a bigger ring, how do I calculate a smaller ring? Uh, so you know this is um, this is part you know I mean doesn't help the calculation but uh, it does put it in context. I can think of I can think I could think of uh, the group the group the cyclic group of order three acting on this with the characters acting acting by the character one in degree one two in degree two and zero in degree three, right? And then this ring is a ring of invariance. Right, so it's not helping. It's just saying. So I want. What I want to do is take this ring. So we know this completely. This is the simplest thing it could possibly be, and I want to truncate it in degree three. So this is the Veronese embedding. This is the case where I'm going to look at the ring, and I'm only going to look at elements in the ring divisible by three. Right, and what we're going to find in there is u cubed. U, V, V cubed, 
and W. Right, so I'm going to call, re rename these X1, X2, Y and Z. Right, so what I've done there is written down the generators of the ring. So you know, I'm just saying, uh, if I take a monomial in U, V and W, and I assume that his degree is divisible by 3, then if he contains U cubed, I can take, off, take out a factor X1. If not, uh, he might contain U he might contain U and V together, in which case I can take a factor of U2. So if, if, he do, if none of those holds, then he's got to be divisible by W or he's got to be divisible by V cubed. Right? So I'm just saying it's basically uh, just an argument on the semi-group of monomials in positive, effective monomials in U, V and W of degree divisible by 3 that any such monomial is uh, a product of these guys. Right, so these are generators for the ring. So, so it looks like this and then divided by some ideal. Right, and uh, also we know the ideal. This is, uh, okay, so, uh, so in, this, in this new ring, uh, you know, I mean, as far as the old ring is concerned, this guy's got degree 3, this guy's got degree 3, this guy's got degree 6, and this one's got degree 9. But I want to think of these as having degree 1, 1, 2, and 3. Right. And so what are the relations at all between them? Can we see any relations? So, uh, you know, there's actually something, you know, I want to translate this into an equation saying that z squared is something. And um, there's a procedure here. So here it's not very important, but uh, so there'll be a, you know, there'll be a g6 of x1, x2, and y. Right. But the process of producing this G6 is sort of in some ways quite complicated. And it's, uh, so in this case, it doesn't matter too much. But later on, this is going to matter. So we have to think of this F9. What is it? It's U to the 18th. And then it's U to the 15th. Uh, uh, so, 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 sorry, U to the 16 times V. Right? I'm writing down all monomials of, of degree 9 in these two variables, U squared and V. Right? And so, you know, it's just going on like this, u to the tenths, v to the fourth, and so on, and then eventually we get to v to the ninth. Right? And you notice that these can be, each one of these monomials, one at a time, is a monomial of degree divisible by 3. And so therefore, it's a, it's a product, it's some monomial in these x1, x2, y. Not completely uniquely defined, because I could possibly change it by this. Right? So, you know, the, the u to the 18th, there's no choice. I've got to send this to x1 to the 6th. Right? And then maybe there's not, not much choice here. I've got to send this one, x1 to the 5th, uh, x2. Right? But as soon as I start getting uh, x1 times y, then I do have a choice, I will have a choice. Right? And so these ones in the middle, you know, for example, what can we do with u to the tenth v to the fourth? Well, u to the tenth v to the fourth is x1 cubed times x times x2 times y. Sorry. X1 cubed times x2 times y, right? 
but this, is, this has got an xy in it, so this can equally well be written as x1 squared x2 to the fourth. Right? So at the moment, it doesn't make any difference. Choose either, because they're, they're all the same modulo this. But in subsequent arguments, so this process is called rendering. Right, so it's really translating. Right, I've got a I've got a list of monomials here. They belong to the mon monom to the semigroup of monomials generated by these guys, and I have to choose a particular way of rendering them. <coughs> so it's like a translation. It's uh, it's it's not at all important here, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, what do we notice? We notice that, you know, I've spent, I've sort of tried to make this look complicated, but uh, this is actually a very simple ring. So R, C, and KS restricted to C is a uh, co-dimension two complete intersection ring. So it's K of X1, X2, and then y and z in degrees 1, 1, 2, and 3. And z squared equals g6. So there's something good about a co-dimension two ideal in that, you know, th th sorry, about a complete intersection ideal. So this is a complete intersection, and I can modify him if I want to. So, so you know, I've got a curve C, and it has this, uh, this G13. I've got this G13, which is P plus a G12. So I'm, I'm going to, it, what happens if I move the curve a bit? So, so, you know, perturb, the, so move a bit, deform, move C to, ne to a neighboring curve. Well, maybe I can do this, but maybe I can move the curve C so that the G13 moves to a G13 in the neighboring fiber. Right? And I want to do this so that the P stops being a base point. So, so I, uh, I probably already have a star. If I call this uh, sort of let me call this exclamation mark. Right. I can uh, move uh, the equations, deform the equations here to uh, nearby equations. X1, Y equals X2 cubed plus lambda times Z. And then z squared, I'm not changing the equation, z squared. So the point is that when lambda is not zero, right, la lambda here is a deformation parameter. Because, uh, because this is a complete intersection, if I take the two equations and I just move them about a bit, any old how, uh, then this is a flat deformation. This deforms a flat deformation family of the of the ring. However, if if I if I can if 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 the z appears in one of the equations with non-zero coefficient, and this lambda was then invertible. It means then I don't need z as a as a as a coordinate in the ring anymore, as a generator of the ring. So then z is no no longer needed as a generator of the ring R. Right? And 
and then uh, so if the z is no longer needed let's substitute z equals this stuff and let's write this here here and then we're getting an equation which is an equation of degree 6 in x1 x2 y so in other words uh, the, 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 the very special thing about this set of equations is that it's a codimension 2 complete in section and that means that I know how to deform it to some new ring, some neighboring ring, where the z is no longer needed as a generator. Right? And that's that means the same thing as saying that this p is no longer a base point of a linear system. So, you know, if I think of the p1123, you know, this is some, uh, this is some weighted projective space, and it's got these two little horns, you know, which are a third of 112 and a half of 111. Singularity. And the equations, the given equations here, the given equations are so this one has got z squared and y cubed in it. Right? And what's happening here is that uh, the curve is meeting this line in one point. Right? And that one point is then a base point, is this point P. Right? But now I can, I, can, I can change the equation here so that Z appears in the equation. And so now I've got Z is a function of X and Y. And uh, the Y is now Y cubed plus some, uh, some, some expressions, some other expressions in x1 squared and x2. So I can eliminate z from the equation using this. And that means that after doing this, the curve C no longer passes through this point. So this is C prime. Right? And so, you know, this is the linear, this is the base, this is the base, if I, if I think of the linear system 1, 1 here, on the weighted projective space, it has this curve here as a base locus. Right? And I've moved away so that it no longer has this point and this curve as a base point. Okay, so, so I've gone slightly over time. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, this, the point is this ring is so, is so easy to describe. It's a codimension 2 complete in section that we can say exactly what the surface is and we can also say what the deformations of the curve to get rid of the base point and the surface to get rid of the base point are. Right? And that's the, uh, that's the, that's at least my treatment of this Horikawa and Ilyev uh, uh, result. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, this argument is easy and it's deceptively easy. As soon as you get into uh, different cases, the arguments get much, much harder. Okay, let, let me leave this for 20 minutes. So.